is uh, the Gwinnett Hills Nursery, and uh, this morning's talk is going to be about uh, my rules of gardening. Uh, how many of you have watched or saw last week's class? Almost everybody. Well, let me do a very quick review <coughs> on what we want from soil. A lot of us talk to you about that. Our biggest influence on plants is the dirt. <clears throat> and how we treat the roots. So what we know is that plant roots aren't uh, in an area of the soil that we were taught 40 years ago. Most plant roots have to live near the surface of the soil, which then a foot of the soil in cities is typical because they, they not only want water, but they need to breathe air. So plants, the green parts of plant take in carbon dioxide, give off oxygen, all the rest of the plant, including the roots, uh, consume oxygen, give off carbon dioxide, just like we do. So the roots have to be able to breathe through the soil um, so they can't generally grow very deep. Now, if you're in a canyon filled with gravel, um, they found roots up to 25 feet deep. In fact, a friend of mine who's a geologist says he's been in fractured rock in earthquake faults 200 foot down and they'll find uh, tree roots down there. So if the air can get in and the water, and there's moisture there, the roots will grow there. If you go into the lava tubes in Hawaii, uh, you'll see roots hanging from the ceiling of the lava tubes and you're probably 20 foot underground. <clears throat> this is that uh, volcanic rock is very permeable to air. So the biggest influence we can have on a plant's health um, other than watering is the soil you provide. Um, generally, most plants we, use, we grow won't get killed by the sun and they won't die from being outside in the shade. But uh, the soil is, is the biggest influence we can do. So you gotta get the soil right. <coughs> and the main thing of last week was that our industry hasn't figured that out yet. So, so what do plants want from their dirt? The main three, one is moisture or water. And most people know that. They, they've got to water their plants on hot days, dry days. Uh, the plant needs moisture because it's always losing water to the atmosphere through the open pores of the leaves. Most of the plant is, uh, the stems and the branches are waterproof, the roots aren't, they've got to absorb the water, the leaves have holes in them that open and close to let in carbon dioxide, let out oxygen, but when they're open to let it in the carbon dioxide, let out the oxygen, the water escapes at that time. So they need a good <coughs> supply of water. Now if you were in uh, New Jersey on a typical day, 85, 90 degrees, 85, 90% humidity. You may not have to water plants very much there. Uh, that humidity is so high that not much escapes. Two is air exchange, so oxygen exchange. This is ignored by a lot, too many people. They, they don't consider it uh, important for plants. And then three, insulation. So the maximum temperature at which roots grow the fastest, or the temperature at which roots grow the fastest, is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Most plant roots, if they're uh, active, can freeze if we drop much below 30 degrees. Or, you know, if the soil temperature drops below 35, the roots start freezing. Now, in the United States, the lower 48 states, the ground does not freeze. Alaska is a different story. That's a totally different climate. So the soil has plays a big part in insulation. Now, roots do not like to be much above 86 degrees either. Their, their uh, operations are hampered if they get too hot. I'll put stability. The soil helps keep plants upright. 
but generally we leave nutrition out of it for the most part. I'll just label it, but there are only a few plants that can actually mine the soil for nutrition. Those are considered the pioneer plants in the area, the weeds in general. So they, they mine the soil, gather the nutrients they need to make themselves. Certain weeds are used to certain types of soil. Uh, once they get the nutrition into their leaves and they die, then other plants come in and steal those nutrients that they have gathered. So for most plants, the soil is not a source of nutrition. University of California Davis did a study of the Central Valley. They, they surveyed the plants and the types of soil that are all around the Central Valley. And their conclusion was the plants weren't getting anything out of the soil because the soil really didn't have much in them. Uh, they said the plants were growing wherever there was a pile of dead leaves on the ground. The plants they were surveying. They weren't surveying weeds, they were surveying things like valley oaks and uh, common bushes and things that exist in the central valley. <laughs> So that's what the soil should provide. Now, what is dirt? Um, soil is sand, silt, and clay. So where does this come from? Well, it turns out uh, soil, this is soil from a friend's farm in Irvine. He says this is the nicest soil he's ever farmed on. What that is, is this a piece of granite that's been ground up in nature. <coughs> So granite is mostly quartz. Um, the white parts of granite are quartz. The quartz turns into particles of sand and silt. So if you melt sand and silt, you get glass because that's what most of the soil is made out of. The darker parts in granite are feldspar, which is silicon dioxide or quartz combined with other minerals like iron or manganese, magnesium, or <coughs> aluminum to make it grayish. Uh, so the color of the soil is due to the feldspar, otherwise this stuff would be quite white. And how does that, so how does this mixture uh, help plants grow? So all soil particles, just draw a giant piece of sand, all soil particles have a charge. Some areas of the world, there's less charge in the soils, but generally in temperate climates, our soil, all the parts are charged negative on the surface, negative charges. So let's say you have a sand. Silt is like a very small piece of sand. And clay, uh, even though it's mostly silicon dioxide, like sand and silt, have the other minerals in their matrix and it makes them different shapes. So clay is like flakes, flat flakes. Think of corn flakes or confetti, <clears throat> but they're also charged. And what that does, so our water molecules, oxygen, two hydrogen atoms. Um, hydrogen's on one side, oxygen on the other. Hydrogen has a positive charge. Oxygen is negative, so water molecules are considered ionic because they have charge, different charges on different <coughs> sides of the molecule. And because of that, these hydrogen atoms are attracted to the negative charges here, positive negative attract each other. So you get a little layer water sticking to each particle. And then you have more water molecules gathering around those because they're there, you know, the, the kind of the water is stuck here with the positive against the, the particle and the negative sticking out. So other molecules, water molecules kind of line up around those. So these particles of soil hold water because of their 
charge and clay being the smallest particle with the largest surface area per weight holds a lot more water molecules. Sand may be thousands of molecules thick with one strong layer of water, several weaker layers of water. Clay may be only 20, they said 28 molecules thick <clears throat> and it may be holding the same amount of water. So <coughs> clay soils hold a lot more water than sand, sandy soils. Uh, now a good quote loam soil, so farmers want loam, that means the soil has all these particles, sand, salt, and clay in them. Now, sand and silt are relatively round, so if you have nothing but sand and silt around, <coughs> excuse me, two thirds of the soil is solid rock, but one third is airspace between the round things. That's if study physics at all, round spheres take up two-thirds of the volume, the space between them one-third of the volume, but if you've got too much clay in there, you lose all your spaces. Actually, the other thing that goes on with soil is that the size of these gaps uh, creates the ease of airflow, the permeability of the soil. So, a couple terms to know, porosity, is the ability of the particle to hold water, uh, permeability, is the ability for the soil to let air flow through there. So the, the roots have to breathe, but they also need the water, so you want both porosity and permeability in the soil. <coughs> Now we know that if you can maximize all these, your, your plants will grow faster. Maximize the water to the roots, maximize the airflow to the roots, maximize nutrition availability to plants, that all makes them grow faster. Um, this time of year, right? The problem we have with most soils is the more sandy an area it is, we get more oxygen, the less water retention. And the more clay the soil contains, the smaller the air spaces, the less the oxygen the plants get if they have more water. So there's a good, you know, for now today's farmers, sandy loam is a good compromise. It holds a bit of water, lots of air flow, the plants grow fast, you got water every day. In the old days, clay was the best soil. They didn't have irrigation. Um, you water once a week, clay soil, just hang on to that water. Plants do, did okay. I mean, they grow faster and like, if you're growing marijuana, the, the, the marijuana is the most expensive crop. So the most expensive crop uses the most expensive items. They all grow them in clay pellets, which is interesting. So this is clay that holds a lot of moisture but it's been fired in the on pellets so that the air can get through. So, so if you want to spend a lot of money and grow all your plants in clay pellets, they grow really fast. You'll be watering every two hours. So, so uh, okay, so we want soil that looks like this. Our industry has told everybody that compost is the best soil. For the last 40, 50 years now, they've been telling us that dead plants, because it's the nutrition that live plants need, is better for growing them in. <clears throat> and we figured out 30 years ago that, it took us 10 years to figure this out. I mean, I wasn't too bright in those days because I listened to everybody else. Uh, it took us 10 years to figure out, no, this is not right at all. This is not something you should add to your soil. This is a different part of the plant's ecosystem. Um, <coughs> so the plants really want to be in sandy loam or sand or decomposed grain, anything that's mineral. <coughs> so in nature, the amount of organic matter underground where the roots are 
ranges from zero to 0.9 percent is what's been found. Well, <clears throat> there's 2.5 percent if it has charcoal. We'll talk about that a little later. But this is the amount of dead stuff that's usually found underground where the plant's roots are living. But above the ground, a very important layer called the duff layer, dead leaves, animal manures, just dead stuff over the top of the ground, five inches deep is the average supposedly around the world. So that's where your compost belongs, or anything that's dead belongs up there. This is the home of bacteria, fungi, uh, earthworms, pill bugs, anything that lives on dead things. Your plant really doesn't want to live in there. Um, you put this over the foliage of a plant, uh, your leaves of your plant start getting eaten up because everything here eats up foliage. That's why plants have stems and trunks is to get out of that duff layer on the ground. Now the problem we have, of course, is that just about everything in the nursery industry currently is still being grown in organic matter. So, you know, if you have a plant that we grew, yeah. Yeah. Now, this is, this is one we fixed. So this is now on our soil. So the soil we created, we wanted to make it act like sandy loam or sand. So we, and you know, sand is a great soil. You didn't see last week's class. When we did a lot of testing in the early 90s, pot, pot full, containers full of sand, we grew the prettiest plants we'd ever grown. When we tried it, we go, okay, this is, this is perfect soil. There's nothing else that beats it. Um, you can grow, you know, a good test plant for anybody would be strawberries. When we, that was the first plant we tested. We grew strawberries in, our, in the potting soils that we were selling, and they grew about six or eight inches across. Berries about the size of my thumbnail. That's what we're used to. And then I grew them in sand, and suddenly we have these plants that were two foot wide, round leaves this big, we're going, okay, there's something really wrong with what we're selling. So now the problem with sand is, of course, is the weight. It's too heavy, so we decided to make something lighter. So we took the lighter versions of sand, which are puffed up. So pumice, perlite are the two lighter things. Uh, perlite's man-made pumice, pumice is volcanic rock. So they're both silicon dioxide, just like sand is, but they're big and full of air holes. Um, we knew that because it was pure white, we couldn't sell it as so well. Most people are used to brown, so we put some peat moss in there. And peat moss is the best way to store water around plants. Now, peat moss is a dead reed from thousands of years ago, but sent at the bottom of the lake, it, just, it, it still decomposes, but at a very slow rate. Whereas, you know, if you have a ground up tree, it can. You grind it up real fine, it can disappear totally in six months. Peat moss, um, five years is what they usually say for this real tiny particle to decompose. So it, it's decom decomposition rate's very slow. If you put this in a bucket of water, it won't stink. If you put this in a bucket of water within a week or so, it smells like a sewer. It's decomposing faster, you don't have enough oxygen in that water. You start getting sewer gases. Um, so the big problem we're having is that our industry <coughs> grows things, and the most common thing is fir bark. The research coming down from the colleges tells 
to growers that, and this is correct, that in a container for the three months it takes to grow that plant from a smaller plant, this is faster than this. Because this has more airflow. The problem with this is it's got great airflow, uh, decent porosity. This is actually more porous than this. When you have bark and pot, you gotta water that thing every day at, at first. It's just too dry. But as this stuff ages and it decomposes, the permeability goes way down, the porosity goes way up, and then the plant starts getting sick roots because you know it's can't well the oxygen level around the roots is dropping. And then if this is starting to create sewer gases, um, a sign of no roots in a plant is this. You see a lot of plants in nurseries in the far corners that have yellow leaves with brown edges. This means there's no roots. Uh, this particular plant, because it was more than half organic matter, you can see how far the soils drop down. So we're losing the, the fluffiness of that soil. It's just going, it's disappearing very quickly. Now, this grower, for, you know, interestingly, we don't use, they usually lose their plants. They get like this, you put them in the ground, they often recover. Uh, the material in there is not the worst we've seen. I mean, we got some growers um, that we know that if, if we don't get the plants out of the pot, <laughs> within six months, you know, there's no way it's ever, ever gonna recover. So we have to, we have to fix them. Okay, how do you fix them? Um, I was kind of taught methods of fixing plants by a NASA scientist who was explaining to me back in the early 90s that our industry didn't know what it was doing and he couldn't understand um, anything about the academia of the horticultural history at that time. He says he couldn't get through to anybody, anybody and if I was interested he'd show me. So what he did is he just had me take a plant. Uh, it, the first plant I took was papaya. In those days papaya is trying to grow them in super soil. Uh, boy it was tough. If you watered them two days in a row the leaves would turn yellow and the plant would fall over and just rot. I mean, that, that quick, two days in a row. Um, so he said, take an ice pick. Um, in retrospect, uh, it's better to use a chopstick. And start poking away at the dirt. And he says, watch your plant. And he wasn't going to tell me what was going to happen, but about half an hour later, I noticed the leaves of my papaya plant went from here, and they did this. And I swore they turned greener at the same time. It's like my papaya was holding its breath in that soil. As soon as you got it out of that soil, it was greener, and it looked way more lively. So that was my introduction to the fact that our, the, 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 the material we're using is so bad. Now this particular grower uses something called redwood grind. Um, they found redwood sawdust was better medium initially because redwood is the slowest decomposed wood. It's not great for plants. So you can grow a plant in redwood sawdust. The color isn't quite right because redwood has a lot of tannins in it that prevent it from rotting. Uh, and it doesn't hold very much water by itself, so the guys who were using redwood sawdust, or redwood compost it was called, had a water an awful off very frequently. So they decided, well, let's make the redwood particles smaller, so now they call it redwood grind. The problem with it now is it's such a small particle that it decomposes much faster. So it causes the plants to rot out within, you know, before, when we had them in redwood compost, we wouldn't see them rot. We'd have them in the same pot for two or three years, nothing happened. Because redwood takes, again, seven years to decompose from the sawdust form. But this redwood grind stuff that we're getting from them holds a lot more water, but it's decomposing at a higher rate. And within six months, the 
lot of the plants are just going, getting real ugly in it. Um, but, you know, they, these growers, uh, you know, I asked the grower, why don't you go and use real dirt? He says, well, my soil company that we that mixes our soils from us doesn't want to use it because it ruins their grinding machine. <laughs> Wood is a lot softer, so the the soil company wants to use you know the, the company creating this blend wants to use wood rather than hummus or sand or anything that would would uh, wear out their machine. So that's the state of our arts. But anyway, uh, so one way is doing this. Now, my son, about six years ago, I was having to do a lot of citrus trees, take it off. You know. It, Using the stick method, it would take about half an hour to do it on a larger plant, like a, a five gallon size plant. Well, I heard some banging out there going, oh, what's he doing? And he came up with a different method where you just drop this root ball on a flat surface <laughs> and loosen it up. Now, this is a little bit too wobbly here. If it was on the concrete, it'd be a little, in fact, let me just set it down for a second. Generally, when I change plants, we're dropping the root ball and turning it, dropping it and turning it, and slowly loosening it up. This one's, this one's got pretty good roots, so it's not coming loose as quickly as I'd like to show you. Sometimes two or three drops and all the dirt's off. Some plants, it's just off. This plant apparently is not so sensitive to the so, okay, so there are a lot of differences in plant tolerance <coughs> to low oxygen levels. That's important to know. Most grasses can get, can live in sewage sludge. Uh, most palm trees can, pines, junipers, and patients, lilies, most lilies, not all, most daisies, not all, roses, they can live in soil with low oxygen levels. The champion is supposed to be pear trees. Uh, so apples and pears can live in a lot of compost. It doesn't seem to hurt them too much. They still do better without it. But it, if you know, buy an impatient in any soil, it's, it, the soil is not going to kill the plant. Or the lily or the daisy. It just won't do it. Whereas the most sensitive plants, the plants that need the most oxygen in their root system, uh, the worst one we've seen, and I forgot to bring it in here, is um, lavender. Mm. But close to that would be avocados. Orchids are bad. Ferns are bad. Um, so there's quite a few plants. Gardenias, real common one. So the, the plants that people tend to try once and then give up on would be those. They, they just can't keep them going. Now the growers do this because they only have to plant for three months. During that time, this ground up wood stuff stays permeable enough for the plants to survive. It's about five months down the road that this medium starts becoming toxic. But, uh, you know, uh, nurseries in California and Southern Florida are unique in that we will have plants containers on the floor year round. If, if you're in most parts of this country, the plants you buy, that we buy in the spring for our customers are gone by fall. So there's fire sales, you know, at most nurseries around September. They want the plants out of there because the first sign of frost, the plant's container's gonna die. They can't be exposed. You know, the problem, one problem with containers is the temperature of your soil in this container is the same as the air temperature. So if it's 25 degrees outside, 25 degrees in here too, you can lose your plants. So the, the nurseries want these off their property into people's yards. And then by the time they die the next year, they just blame the homeowner. You watered it too much. So that's what we hear the most. You've overwatered. Well, 
That term was invented in the 1980s. We had never heard that before. I don't think real farmers ever hear that term. You know, when they had, when we had that nice snowstorm, what was it, 2018? That alleviated the drought. They had so much water in this area, as they told the farmers to just turn on your water and don't turn it off. They wanted to replenish the water tables in the Central Valleys. And, you know, the farmers know that if they water too much, nothing happens. It just passes through the root zone of the plant and keeps on going. So now they're, it's mainly the vineyards that are doing it. The vineyards use less fertilizer, so there's less leaching of the nutrients deep into the water table. So the, 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 yeah, the vineyards are the ones being told, if we have excess water, you turn your water on. We won't charge you. Just get your get the um, water table replenished down there. Hmm. So, so anyway, um, back to this. So when you get this pretty cleaned off, I mean, if you get it down to a small size, you know, if you take half the soil off the plant, we've never seen them go into shock. If you want to take it all off, certain plants you need to like. I would say Gerber, a daisy, or lavender, you gotta take it all off. Even then, your chances of success are not the greatest, especially on lavender. We found just a little bit of compost around a lavender, crown of a lavender plant can just rot it out. So, but most plants, they can have, you know, this couple inches of soil, um, you know, this is four inch wide, but it, it's only two inches from the inside as a goop ball to the outside. That doesn't seem to be enough to if it's compost to kill most things, I mean, it kill lavender, but a lot of things, like tomatoes need very little oxygen in their soil. So, um, <coughs> so that's not a problem. Even the six pack's even better. So the smaller plants you buy, the more likely to have success. Once you get to a six inch root ball like this, uh, success rates can start going down, so it's nice to take a little bit of this off at least. Now if you take it all off, if the plant is, is in the shade, like this is Helleborus goes into the shade, no worries, you can do it just about, an, you know, unless it's 100 degrees out and the wind's blowing like crazy, you can do that just about any time and then plant it in the shade into the native soil and there's no issue. If you're going to the sunlight, uh, what we find if you take all the soil off, if you're in only in half of this sun, you're fine. So a friend of mine was doing some citrus at their orchard and I noticed that their containers, they had got them from uh, a big box store, and the wrong kind of soil, not the stuff that they normally get them in. So I said, told them you've got to take that root ball apart. So they did it, and what they did is they strung up essentially plastic sails on both sides of the plant, you know, put stakes in the ground, hung a plastic bag on two sides of the plant so it was only getting sun for a few hours each day. And they didn't lose any, they were doing it <coughs> still in summer too, bear rooting their citrus and putting them in. So we, we've seen that work. So if, it, if you put a plant that's normally in the sun in too dark a spot, just after you do this, sometimes it doesn't get enough energy to recover. You gotta make sure they have some light on them. Now, indoor plants, you don't have to worry at all. I mean, you can do an in indoor plant, change all the soil off it, put it back in the pot with better dirt. Uh, our top pot is what we created, again, to replace the composting soil. If you're going back into a pot, that's a perfect container soil. Now, again, sand is fine. If you, if you don't mind the weight of sand, sand is almost as heavy as real dirt. Dirt is over 100 pounds per cubic foot, so sand is close, uh, close to that. So the weight is can be an issue, but that's what people used to grow plants in. I mean, back in the 50s, my dad grew all his plants in something that looked like this. And I remember it because I played in it. I know the texture. Can you buy store-bought sand or not? I mean, I could place one for your for your um, 
sandbox for the kids sandbox. Sure, sand from a sandbox more expensive needs to be, but it's, okay. it worked. We tried all the different sands to grow plants in, and every single sand did fine. Okay. I mean, you got great results. Okay, so when you plant things in the ground, once the soil's right, <clears throat> you don't really have to worry about it. You can just make a hole big enough to put in the ground. As long as it's normal soil, or good soil, then generally the main thing we're worried about at this point is to get it well watered. So the, the dirt you dig out of the hole, you put around the sides, make a, a nice berm and water through here. So one of the problems we have is if you have soil that was from a container, a uh, soil used container generally ha is less absorbent than dirt. So dirt is like blotter paper and the soil we use in pots is less so because it's got to drain out the bottom holes. You know, if the water sits in here for weeks and weeks, the water eventually runs out of oxygen. I didn't mention that. So, uh, water has oxygen dissolved in it. Tap water, by law, five to seven parts per million. Plants need usually above two parts per million for them to breathe in water. Just like fish, plant roots can breathe in water. So, water can't, you can't overwater a plant if the water has oxygen in it. The way you run out of oxygen, either you have a lot of dead stuff in it, like this compost, that steals oxygen very quickly, or the water doesn't move for weeks and weeks, and the roots eventually use the oxygen up in the water, and then they, then they start suffocating and rotting at that point. So the soil in pots can't hold its water as well, or can't absorb it as well as soil around in the ground, so when you water here, the water tends to get pulled out of it. If you water here, the water doesn't go into the root ball. Now this is critical for the first week or two until the roots get out of that root ball. So a lot of trees, big trees, if you don't have a nice well around them, you can get foliage damage on them that looks kind of like this if you don't water right through that root ball. You can set a dripper right on top of it. You can make a berm round and water by sprinklers or by hand. You've got to water right through there for the first week or two. Once the roots are out of an inch or two, and it doesn't take them long to do that, um, they then can grab the water out of the soil around them. That's when we call a plant established. Once it's no longer dependent on you watering right here. Now the other thing we have to worry about is the size. This is a, this wooden <coughs> tub here is a 24 inch box. And the problem we're having is that in nature a plant wouldn't grow roots that deep. So in general, plant roots grow a foot deep. I've dug out trees in my yard this big when I was younger. <laughs> Um, in my 20s when I could still do things like that. But I dug a few trees out of the ground in my yard this big around, roots that big, this far underneath the ground. They didn't show above the surface at all, but they weren't very deep. Huge roots, and they can run a long ways. Roots of trees can go three to 20 times wider than the tree is tall. And this, I dug out a 20 year old maple tree 30 foot tall, roots went to my back door. From the, and there, it was a street tree, ran to the slab my front of my house, all the way around the slab to my back door. Went go underneath the slab. No oxygen underneath the slab of the house, so roots generally don't go there. Sidewalks, different story. Sidewalks, sand underneath the sidewalk, roots love that, they'll lift them up. So the problem we have with these is they're too deep. The U.S. Department of Agriculture 20 years ago told us, 22 years ago in fact, told us when you're planting box trees, 
put pipes in the ground around them with holes in them. Perforated pipes on all four sides. Backfill with the native soil. But these air pipes will keep air going to the bottom of that root ball until the roots start growing and come back up to the surface where they can actually breathe. Otherwise, what happens when you plant one of these big trees, you lose all those bottom roots. The tree sits there for half a year or a year because it's got to go new roots first. You lost half the root system. And can you imagine if you put planter mix compost in this hole with the tree, you lose all your roots. And unfortunately, we know most gardeners, you know, they, they listen to the wrong people. So. They were told, you know, some gardeners say, well, if a little bit is, is good, then I'll put a whole, make a pure planter mix around these trees. <laughs> Those trees will just sit there and sit there and sit there <laughs> with no roots. The other problem we have, of course, with uh, this, the composty soil that the growers use is all the trees start leaning after here because the soil around the roots is, is shrinking so that you gotta stake those things. I mean, we don't like to sell trees with stakes on them. And, you know, we started staking trees in the 80s because everything started to lean in the pots. Before then, a lot of most trees didn't have, need stakes. And now almost every tree needs a stake because it's gonna lean that the soil right around its crown is just shrinking. <coughs> So they make a lot of other rules that uh, because of the compost and soil, so besides over water, don't water too often, don't put mulch on top of the root ball or the trunk because it rots everything. Well, yeah, if you've got compost here and compost here, yeah, you're, you're creating that rot. In nature, nobody clears the dead leaves away from the trunks of trees. A friend of mine went down to Guatemala, I says, five foot deep leaves around some of those jungle trees. <clears throat> so as long as there's air to the, can make it through those dead leaves, um, you won't cause trouble with the roots. Now, you know, there is, so I have an issue with compost. You know, when a tree dies in a forest, it may take hundreds of years for it to decompose. You grind it up like this, it'll decompose in six months. What's natural about that? So, you know, everyone sells compost when everything's chopped up real small. Uh, it can decompose so fast. Those things, those compost piles can catch on fire. In nature, that doesn't really happen. The dead leaves don't decompose that <coughs> quickly. So, you know, they're it's better if we don't chop things up so small. They decompose, or, you know, if you have a piece of wood, throw it in a pond, it might get feel a little slimy after a few months. But you can take that same piece of wood, chop it into pieces this small, and it'll make that pond turn ugly because the decomposition rate on it, when it's chopped up that small, it's so fast. Okay. Um, so when you take the tree, and you're going to put it in the ground, you would use your soil, right? Don't need to. It, well, okay, if the tree is perfect, okay. it's one something we grew, you just put it right in the ground. Okay. The soil we have is so permeable right. that even if you run around and play, it's going to get air all the way through the root system. If you get it from someone else, take you want to you can put the air pipes around it, you can take that stuff off, you can put our soil around it. Uh, the LA Airport, when they when they planted back in the 80s, their instructions were, uh, so these arborists knew what they were doing, they said, each palm tree, each bird of paradise that they're planting, you're gonna surround it with solid sand. I don't know what the airport soil is like. That area, you know, close to the ocean, it's gotta be clay in that area. So they, they knew to, to just surround each plant with sand. I have a friend, I had a friend, passed away recently, but he was a landscaper for 40, 50 years, and he says he had always 
put sand around each plant he planted, he never lost anything. So you make sure those roots breathe initially, and then they'll make their way to the clay, no problem. So in the clay soils, the roots will just be closer to the surface. In sandy soils, they can live deeper. Now again, if you're growing plants for a crop, um, the more air you get to the roots, the faster they grow. So what a lot of, a lot of people do for their little backyards is make raised beds. So when, if you make a raised bed and fill it with dirt, even just the native soil, because you raise it above grade, you water this up here, the water gets sucked down to that level. And as it gets sucked down to this level, it pulls the air in after it. So this soil breathes much better than the surrounding soil of the dirt. So when you ra have the raised bed, it breathes really well. And the plants grow faster and because of that. Plus, usually it's a little warmer, it's raised up. Can you fill with our soil? You can fill it with our soil, but just regular soil raised up makes it breathe. Now, what's interesting is the height to raise it. So on strawberries, we know in Irvine, with soil that looks like this very sandy soil, they raise their beds 18 inches to grow strawberries there. That makes the strawberries grow really fast, the leave big leaves, all that. In the Central California coast, where a lot of strawberries are grown, they got clay soil along that coastline. Their beds are raised three feet. Yeah. So they raise it uh, over twice as much as they do with the better soil to make the same thing. I mean, they drape plastic over these raised beds so that the water doesn't wash them away. Clay moves in water. Sand, if you make a, a mound out of sand, you can shoot the water out. It doesn't move anywhere. Sand is so such heavy particles, it's hard for water to move. It's like on the beach. You see the waves hitting the beach. Sand doesn't move very far on the beach. The clay being such a tiny particle, it moves. So you gotta keep it covered with something to keep it from moving or putting the raised bed. Oh the air well the atmosphere too. Yeah, if the water thing pulled down, as the water gets pulled down, the air gets pulled behind it. So when soil particles um, the water sticks to them, you can pull it down so it's, when the soil is saturated, that's when all the spaces between the soil particles are filled with water, but if you drain the soil, the water is still stuck on the particles, you know, that one, mo at least one molecule thick, usually it's several molecule layers because they're all clinging to each other, and that's the field capacity of the soil, they call it, when, you, when the excess water drains away. And that's retention of the water. What about raised beds? If they have raised bed soil, is that garbage or? Yes. It's, so what they're selling you is pretty much neutral dead plants. So you don't want to buy anything called garden soil or topsoil because it's not soil at all. I mean, if it was soil, you couldn't lift those bags. They weigh over 100 pounds. But they're generally ground up trees uh, with some you know, manure is added to make it rich. They, everybody, you know, these companies think that the soil needs to be divided into Christian. That's their problem. They think that the soil, the, the role of soil is, the main role is to provide nutrition. So you can use garden soil as a mulch layer on top of the ground if you like. If you, you know, if you buy it, you can just put it on the surface and use it that way. But if you try to grow a plant in it, you'll get a real small, We've seen the results. Everybody who shows us plants that are this big, tomato plants that just grow like this and stop because they can't grow roots in it. You know, they got this bed filled this deep with that garden soil, and the roots can penetrate about this far, and then they stop because they can't breathe. It might work for some plants, like tomatoes will probably grow in almost any garden soil, but try to grow basil or anything else in there and just get stunted. So where do you buy the soil that is either one? 
I mean, for a raise, for so, if we wanted to buy large quantities. So the companies that sell it would be the companies that have tractors and dump trucks. Okay. Uh, sometimes you can find loam and bags at a big box store, but it's going to be pricey. If you buy it in bulk then it's one third the price of something in bags or even less than that. Like sandy loam, if you use sandy loam, which is what a farmer would want on his farm, um, about 5% clay, just so you know, five to 10% clay. Uh, per yard, you know, I haven't bought it for 10 years, so it's probably gone up. But 10 years ago, it'd be about uh, $30 a yard. And where would you buy that? building supply companies. So in Santa Ana, there's Thompson's Building Supply, and Coast Mesa, there's Larry's Building Supply. In South County, there's Sepulveda Building Supply. There's a Blue Ribbon Building Supply up here, I think, in Bell Park, or whatever it's called. <coughs> um, so there's building supplies for, they just have front loaders and uh, dump trucks. If you own a pickup, you can just drive a pickup with no shell on it, they'll put one scoop in there, that's about all a pickup can hold. That's half a yard, might cost you $20, 20, 25 bucks, which is equivalent to about uh, 13, 14, actually probably about 15 of our bags, which run close to $20 a bag. So for the price of essentially one bag, you can fill up your truck. So dirt is dirt cheap. <laughs> yeah. Some of our customers love decomposed granite, which is between granite and sandy loam. <laughs> so off of a hill, uh, you get decomposed granite. Once it's through a riverbed, it becomes sandy loam. The pieces are smaller and more rounded. That's really the difference. Okay, uh, note on watering. So. If the soil is done right, you can add as much water as you want. The water you're adding has got enough oxygen and you can't overwater anything. Now, how much water do you need on plants? <clears throat> well, in general, you want your entire root system, if, you're, if, you're plant, if you want your plant to either grow or produce a crop, you've got to keep the entire root system moist. If, if only half of it's moist, the plant's going to sh start shutting down and not be productive. If it's just a green plant, like a hedge, no problem, so you let the thing dry up quite a bit. But if you want it to be productive, you've got to keep it wet. Now, before farmers had computers and soil probes, <coughs> and some still do this, they walk around your field with a piece of rebar. Um, you can buy rebar shaped like an L, just about this size, and it could be, you know, skinnier, size of a pencil up to about this <coughs> And you push this thing in the ground as hard as you can and see how deep you can push it. That's how deep your moisture is going from the surface. So if you're watering from the surface and you can push it in about a foot deep, your plants are pretty happy. Uh, farmers, usually the soil on a farm is a little bit better and the roots go a little farther. So they want it to be closer to a foot and a half. If they can push this in a foot and a half by hand, they're in good shape. If you can only push it in eight inches, your plants are starting to shut down. So we've noticed on grass, so I've, I've, when I had a lawn back in those days, I would notice that, you know, especially remember 1998, we had like 30 inches of rain, and I could put this rebar in the ground like <coughs> all the way to the handle, I'm going, oh my God, and I had clay soil. It just went all the way in. I was going, well, this is, this is wild. This soil is really wet this year. Um, I noticed that at about eight inches of depth, the grass started looking a little peaked. It wasn't as green, it wasn't standing up quite as straight. When the moisture level got down to about six inches, you started getting those bite tips on the blades of the grass. Right around four inches of moisture, the grass just turned brown. So grass doesn't die. All grass comes from areas of the world that it's dry for at least three months of the year. So they just go to sleep. They just, you know, three inches of moisture left, they go to sleep. They just turn brown. They can even disappear. I mean, in parts, uh, the first lawn I had, I didn't know all this stuff, and I was watering it. I was running my lawn 40 minutes, for 40 minutes, three days a week. I thought, I'm gonna get a lot of water in the ground. And what happened was I was developing these big areas with just dirt. My grass disappeared. 
And I thought, God, it's got to be insects. So I spray for insects. And maybe it's fungus. Put fungicide and nothing helped. And I was just so upset, I just decided, well, I, when, I, when I started this lump from seed, I watered three times a day, every day. So I turned my sprinklers back on three times a day, and in two weeks, the whole lawn was back. I'm going, oh, something about that uh, short interval. So the water district says, if you're using sprinklers, don't leave them on for more than four minutes. Because four minutes is as much as the ground can absorb. If you leave it on longer than that, the water tends to pool in the low spots. The high spots don't get any extra water. It pools in the low spots. The low spots of your lawn get all the water. Higher spots are still bone dry. So the ground absorbs about a quarter inch, one eighth to one quarter inch of water per hour, which is about four minutes of sprinkler time. So you can turn it on every hour for five minutes and it'll absorb that. But you have it on for more than four minutes, you're, you are, the water is being distributed unevenly. It's gonna run in the street, run into the low spots, your higher spots, you know, any slope at all, you're gonna lose water off those areas. So it's better to water frequently and lightly. So um, on the farms, they wanna do a study because in the old days, all they could do is flood irrigate the fields. Once a week, flood it. Every week, flood it. We wanted to see if uh, micro sprinklers were effective. So they watered uh, half an orchard with micro sprinklers daily, lightly. The other half, flood irrigation. And then they dug the trees out of the ground. This was an almond orchard to see what the roots, how the roots responded. Well, the side that was watered lightly daily had deeper roots. That they weren't expecting that at all. They thought that once a week deep irrigation would drive the roots down deeper to get the water. It was killing them. It was killing the deep roots. That too much water down deep not going away fast enough. Well, you know, they didn't really say what was causing the shallow roots on the flood irrigated side, but they said with this lightly irrigated, frequently watered side, no disadvantages. So all the farms now water daily. The more frequently you water, the less water you need to use. So there, is, there are farms that water up to 18 times a day with drip systems. They said, uh, they, said they claimed they saved 30% of the water bill. No loss in crop. So what they were doing is, every, they, were, they had computers going, probes going, uh, every hour that the temperature was above 80 degrees, they replaced the water the plant used. This was in the Central Valley, so it's 80 degrees for like 18 hours of the day. So um, they would just turn on the water, the computers would do it, and replace the water that the plants had used that last hour. And they said, yeah, uh, it got by with a lot less water. questions on irrigation. Um, so the amount of water plants need, well if you keep, so the main thing is you want to keep your moisture level down about a foot. So if you just keep checking that, see if you can penetrate a foot, you can, you know, manipulate your water system. You go, okay, in the middle of January normally one four minute period of water a week will keep a lawn happy. In the summer it'll take 10. 10 four minute waters, which means you gotta water several times on the, on one day or two days, you know, several days a week, you gotta water more than once a day to keep grass happy. Now, um, now most fruit trees, well, generally we don't grow fruit trees as big as we used to, but in the old days, the average fruit tree might be 15 foot by 15 foot. In Riverside, the textbooks I have say in the UC Riverside, they were measuring 50 gallons of water use per day on a 15 foot fruit tree at 90 degree temperatures on a June day, longest days of the year. That's a lot of water. I mean, you know, agriculture in California uses 70% or more of the water that's stored. Humans, you know, fam you know, houses do not use much water compared to what farms use. Uh, and if, if it's 70% for farms, you figure green belts are using it probably 50% of the rest of that. And our homes maybe 50% of that. 
So we're, you know, the fact that they shut our water down on drought years is not doing a whole lot. <laughs> but uh, this, you know, it's just so that we're all in the same game, I guess, with the farmers. We have to suffer just as much. So, well, that's watering. Now, there's another issue with plants that no one usually mentions, and that's the replant syndrome. <clears throat> and this is real important. So the reason that farmers rotate crops, and the reason why there's succession in nature. So if you have a tree die, and not by fire, just by natural causes, usually that tree cannot grow in that same spot for a long time. You get grasses and weeds growing, and then you get bushes growing, and then maybe 20 years later you get another tree starting up in that same spot. The Forest Department figured this out back six, 40 years ago. They said <clears throat> the reason why plants die and get, get old, sick, and die is because the root system dies in the ground around them, and it kills them off. So they said plants can keep trees, they're just studying trees, of course, the forest department, can continue staying healthy as long as they can every year grow roots further and further away. Because their older roots are now dead and cause a lot of disease issues in the original location, so they grow outwards. And the further they can grow, the longer they can live. So the biggest trees in the world often live the longest. Uh, <coughs> redwood trees, the sequoias, they said 5,000 years. But eventually, the root system's too big to sustain, and they die rather quickly. So you can tell a tree that's healthy, you know, if the sequoia tree's healthy, it's got that spire shape. Once the top starts getting rounded and all this stuff, it's 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 going downhill. It can't maintain a bigger tree with bigger roots, and the death comes quite quickly. And you know, it might be a couple hundred years in the case of a redwood tree, but that's still quite fast. And if it's in its lifetime, it dies quickly. The only way around that is a really hot wildfire. So if you have a wildfire. That'll, you know, the wildfires don't, the heat from wildfire will sterilize the soil, not real deep. They said it's like six or eight inches down. You'll incinerate the roots, you'll kill off the diseases, and when that happens, the same trees can grow back. You don't, if you prevent a wildfire, your, your tree population is going to change. And they've seen that all across the country. They said all the trees at the, at the entrance to Yosemite are dying because they haven't let it burn down. So another type of tree has to grow in. Another something that's unrelated has to grow back in. Uh, they said they're losing all the oaks in the uh, back uh, Appalachians because they're not letting them burn. Pine trees are coming to take over. People are going, what's going on? Well, you gotta let this stuff burn to sterilize. Otherwise, something else grows there. So in your vegetable gardens, a long time ago, farmers found that if they didn't farm that land every year with the same crop, the plants did better. And they thought it was, and still to this day, farmers will explain, oh, that crop depleted the soil, something I can't put back in. Well, we know what plants need, so there's no truth to that one. What plants are putting in the ground is dead roots of themselves. Um, and so something else is up, it comes in that's not related. So on the little, little flyer I put on your chairs, it's got the vegetables, and then it's got on the right side, right column there, it's got them in their families. So any of them within a single family, you don't want to put in the next year. So now we were next to an organic farmer. We rented land from an organic farmer for four years and I watched them do their crops. He told me he was on a 10 crop rotation cycle. So in the four years we were there, we never saw him put the same crop in the same dirt twice. Hmm. 
<coughs> hard for a homeowner to do. Um, <coughs> I would say have at least a three-year rotation cycle would be probably okay, but four is better. So if you have, say, four beds, you put all your your salanaceae or tomato, <coughs> peppers, eggplant in that bed this year. The next year you move it over here, the next year you move it over there, the next year you move there, and then you go back to the first one again. I mean, we have a lot of customers that say, tell me tomatoes is the only crop they want to grow. It's like, okay. Mm -hmm. So we tried that in a, in a bed at our house to see what would happen to a tomato plant if you put in the same bed. So the first year, of course, everything was perfect. Big crop, no problems. Second year, I would say 80% as good as the first. It wasn't bad. 80% of the crop was there. The plant turned yellow at the end. Third year, nothing. Couldn't get much out of it at all plant turned yellow really fast. It got root rot diseases from two, you know, two seasons, uh, three or four months each of growing tomato roots. That third year was really bad. And then you couldn't really plant tomatoes in there for another three years. So <clears throat> it's better to keep rotating and you won't come across that. So it takes time for these roots to die and, and become, and, and leave the spot. Now, the longer you grow a plant in one spot, the worse it is. In apple orchard, well, I'd say in vineyards in Napa Valley, um, they're not allowed to grow anything but grapes in the Napa Valley, which is kind of silly, but that's the rules there. So when the grapevines get old, 40, 50 years old, they pull them out, they have to leave the ground fallow, which means they have to grow weeds for 10 years. They said it takes 10 years for that amount of woody roots to decay and be gone and not cause trouble with the new at least not significant problems with the new grapes. Uh, they should, you know, if they just rotate their crop, they can grow something else. Not have to waste their time, but that's the rules. Uh, apple orchards, they did a study on apple replant syndrome and found out, you know, because apple trees live a long time, they can live over 100 years. <clears throat> if an apple tree is killed for some reason, they, in order to get another apple tree in there and do well, they replaced about half a yard of dirt that's a hole three foot wide one and a half foot deep they replace the soil with soil from another orchard that didn't grow apples just put that soil in that hole <coughs> the surrounding soil still had dying apple roots in it uh, but there was a lot of apple trees around also they said it felt it did real well in that setup it actually did better they said than putting a new apple tree in a new orchard because of the ecosystem that was already established there with the other apple trees it liked being around its its established relatives so in, in nature too you have to remember that um, what we're being told by the fungus people is that the king of your garden is not your plants or you it's mycorrhizal fungus So the biggest organism in the yard may be a fungus, a beneficial fungus that lives in the ground. So back in the 70s, I believe, the horticulturists and botanists found out that most of the roots in the ground they thought were belonged to the plants weren't their roots at all. So the plants are growing a root system. But this fungus in the ground looked like plant roots with connectium. And they said 80% of what they thought were the tree's roots were actually a fungus that was attached to the tree's roots. Especially the little roots, the ones that look like they thought were root hairs. A lot of them were this mycorrhizal fungus. It's a, they said it took an mi uh, electron microscope to figure out that this wasn't a part of the tree. So it turns out that 95% of all plant species associate with the mycorrhizal fungus. So this fungus, um, what they get from the plant, they get sugar. So the plant makes sugar, it sends it down to its bark, to the roots. 
the fungus uses the sugar to create its own body. I mean, plants in general are made out of cellulose. Cellulose is a um, rearranged sugar molecule that you can't eat. Only bacteria can eat cellulose. So if you're a beaver, you have to have bacteria in your gut to eat your uh, cellulose. Or if you're a termite, you have to have bacteria in your gut to eat the cellulose and turn it into sugar. Uh, but anyway, the mycorrhizal fungus gets that from the trees. What the tree gets in return from the mycorrhizal fungus, the mycorrhizae will share water nutrients throughout your garden. And they will also eat up all the leaves on the surface. So this fungus goes up into the surface, eats up all the dead stuff on top of the ground and gives it back to the trees. It's a different system than compost piles. Compost piles, bacterial degradation. The research that we've looked read says that mycorrhizal fungi can recycle the nutrients of a dead leaf faster than a compost pile can. It said 90 days from a leaf falling on the ground for the nutrients to be recycled into the same tree. And mycorrhizal fungus can distribute water throughout your garden. Um, what's really weird, um, is that fungi can, the hyphae of fungus can transmit electrical signals. So these uh, fungus experts claim if you walk in the forest, the forest knows you're walking through it. So do we buy stuff to put that fungus in our yard? You pot, you may, so okay, if you're, if you're growing stuff in sterile soil, like our potting soil is kind of sterile, it would be worth adding it. In the ground, you don't, you should not have to. <clears throat> the, the fungus spores float in the air. So most of the mushrooms you see coming out of the dirt are a type of mycorrhizal fungi. <clears throat> They're coming in directly out of a trunk of a tree. They're not. But the ones that live in the dirt, a lot of those are mycorrhizal fungi. And their spores are scattered through the air, and then they land somewhere else and start growing again. Um, I talked to a lady from uh, UC Riverside who went up in the 90s to uh, or late 80s, early 90s, to Mount St. Helens to see how fast the mycorrhizal fungus reestablished itself. She said five years, that whole area of blast area was like 200 square miles, yeah. was repopulated with the mycorrhizals. So mycorrhizal fungus have been partners with most plants since they came on land, I don't know how long ago, a billion years ago? <laughs> For a long time, because they said the plants couldn't eat the rocks that were on the ground. The fungus could, so they partnered up with the fungus to uh, survive on land. There's a few plants that don't need the mycorrhizae, that don't even like it, that are highly evolved, certain grasses, orchids. Um, they have the ability to gather the nutrients out of the rocks and, and things themselves. And orchids live off of the animal poop, off in the trees, so they don't need them either. But the majority of plants that we grow operate with this mycorrhizal fungus. Mycorrhizal fungus does not want the ground turned over. That disturbs them greatly. So, uh, vegetable gardens, you know, there's one reason to till a vegetable garden. So one of the worst things about vegetable gardens in a home setup is that if you have a tree over here, all its roots are in your vegetable garden. So tilling them gets rid of those roots temporarily, and that's really the only good reason to till is to kill all the roots from bushes and trees around that area. Otherwise, you can keep them out of there by building, uh, you know, something uh, to keep them out. We block cloth or sealing it off or having an elevated bed instead of a raised bed so it's off the ground. Keep those roots out of there. Otherwise, don't till. So farmers, the new generation of farmers, hopefully will get the message and stop tilling the ground. Um, and then, of course, you want to save everything you grow and keep it in your yard. If you throw it away, you've got to buy more fertilizer. So, so 
note about fertilizer. Um, plants are generally made out of 17 minerals. Um, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. See my cheat sheet here. Uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, iron, me, calcium, iron, magnesium, boron, manganese, these are all um, scientific symbols for copper, zinc, molybdenum, fluorine, and nickel. So those are the 17, 17 minerals that are in plants. Every plant has those 17. We actually think uh, silicon belongs there too. It's just that generally you don't have to add silicon because that's what soil is, it's silicon. But some researchers have noticed that they sprayed silicon on their crops. If they're, you know, if they're hothouse grown uh, in artificial soil, the silicon helped the plants. Well, it just had to grow in the ground instead. But anyway, uh, so silicon might be a part of plants too. But so carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, water, and air have that. You don't have to apply those, and they become sugar and cellulose. <coughs> so um, the power that the energy the plants save is sugar or their bodies, which are made out of silos, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Nitrogen is the um, kind of the surface uh, membranes of all cells. So our skin is nitrogen, our hair is nitrogen. The walls of your, the, your cell membranes are nitrogen. Um, so nitrogen is real important on plants. Then potassium, the K is potassium. In animals, it's the salt that balances your blood. In animals, it's the salt that balances the sap. Same type of thing in each each of us. So, no particular role in potassium. It is, you know, in abundance in fruit. You want juicy fruit, you add more potassium. It's just the juice of a plant has to have potassium in it. Our bodies have to have potassium while we shrivel up. Phosphorus in both animals and plants is a energy transfer molecule. So if you've taken biochemistry, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, ADP, adenosine diphosphate are the energy transfer molecules. So if you want to get energy to anything, do anything, you need phosphorus. Sulfur is a part of a lot of enzymes. Um, calcium major part of wood is calcium. Iron, a lot of these metals, iron, manganese, uh, magnesium, copper, zinc, uh, I think molybdenum too, are part of the chlorophyll molecules. So if you're missing those, your plants don't look so green. You get all kinds of weird patterns. So the chlorophyll molecule, which turns sunlight, energy of sunlight into a sugar molecule, uh, uses those. Uh, chlorine, I'm not sure what that's for. Anyway, all parts of the plant need these minerals. Some people say, oh, you need a lot of phosphorus for roots. No, you need it for everything. Um, you need a lot of potassium for fruit. No, you need it for everything. Nitrogen, you need it for everything. I mean, everything needs all these minerals because <coughs> pretty much every cell of the plant has them. <coughs> can't leave anything out. Now, the main, the main, these are the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium are considered the major nutrients that we need. You need more of that than just anything else. The minor nutrients would be things like sulfur, calcium, um, then the rest of them are micro. I mean, iron, we used to sell a lot of iron. We didn't sell anymore. Iron's a micronutrient. You need very little iron for uh, to 
run a plant. Uh, generally, our soil has enough iron. You know, if your soil is brown at all, it's got the iron in it. Um, like zinc. They, they, they said one time they cured an entire orchard with zinc deficient just by hammering a galvanized nail in the trunk of each tree. That was enough to cure them. So they, didn't, they don't need much. Uh, molybdenum is a matter of ounces per acre. So uh, you don't need much of the micronutrients. <laughs> but nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. So using on a fertilizer bag, it's this order, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. The ratio in most growing plants, seven to four. It's about the ratio. And when we, the U.S. Farm Agriculture has sent literature to most farmers telling us that the ratio they should apply seems to be somewhere in here, it's like six to two, four, something like that. Those numbers for just about any crop they grow would need about those same numbers. Now in Orange County, one of the few things our soil has a lot of, phosphorus. We don't really have to add it to the ground. To pot you do, uh, but the soils in Orange County are supposed to have adequate phosphorus or even excessive phosphorus, so that's one thing we don't have to have. Mainly it's nitrogen and potassium. So nitrogen, unfortunately nitrogen is a volatile mi mi uh, mineral. So it, it can evaporate and blow away as ammonia. It can be leached out of the ground as nitrates. It's very mobile. So that one we have to keep adding. Potassium doesn't move much. Phosphorus doesn't move at all. So if you add these once, you're okay. Uh, you don't have to add it again for a long time unless you, you, know, you keep on putting your leaves out in the trash, pulling your weeds, putting in the trash. You might have to add more eventually. But the nitrogen is always needs to be replenished unless you keep everything on your property. What would it be for strawberries? Well, we use numbers like this when we grow strawberries and they seem to be fine. Um, people who don't really study a lot, they'll say, well, we want something balanced, so we'll do something like 14, 14, 14, just because they didn't know any better. You know, a lot of gardeners, that's, you know, when they invented this term, balanced fertilizer. They thought if all the numbers are the same, it's balanced. Well, the plant's not balanced, so your fertilizer shouldn't be either, but I mean, there's fertilizers out there like 20, 20, 20. Chemical fertilizers are 20, 20. The gardeners love them. They put on the plants, boy, but they look good. The problem with that much phosphorus is the levels build up really high. And high levels of soluble phosphorus will wipe out your mycorrhizal fungus. Mycorrhizans can't. So in nature, phosphorus is rarely, rarely soluble. It's the hardest thing for plants to pick up. That's the role of the mycorrhizal fungus to get the phosphorus into the plants. You put down soluble phosphorus, it just burns the mycorrhizal out. They can't handle that. Like Miracle Grove used to be 15, 30, 15. Because the plants looked so good when they applied it, but I guess they were told about 20 years ago this is really bad. So now their their numbers are more like 15, 9, 12. They, they made it better. <coughs> so it wasn't so high on the phosphorus because that is a hard number, hard mineral for plants to pick up. You, you put it on that strong, the plants look great. You kill, you wiped out nature though. They're going to depend on you to fertilize them for the rest of their, of their life. So when you put down a 20, 20, 20, this number always needs to be replenished. These just keep building up higher and higher and higher, so you have to watch out. Generally, if you stay organic, you're in the ballpark. So, you know, one of the nicer fertilizers are the seed meals because you figure this is good for a, a baby plant. It's got to be what the plant needs. <laughs> so you can see the ratio 612, 621. They're in the ballpark of 724. So 
because right at the seed is what you get. You get about the right nourishment for most plants. One of our favorite fruit tree fertilizers, 624, makes sense to us. Plus, this has 8% uh, calcium, so it's like a 6248 calcium. So, uh, Dave Wolf's nursery, which is our biggest supplier of fruit trees in the U.S., really, their sales reps keep telling us, keep pushing the, the calcium. The plants need cal, you know, the fruit trees especially because that's their wood. The wood has a lot of calcium in it. Uh, and the fruit needs the calcium to finish off its fruit. So if you, you know, you're on a tomato, if you get the hard bottom, that's called blossom end rot, that's a lack of calcium in the tomato. You get the same thing in squash, <coughs> peppers. You get hard spots in the flesh of an apple, that's a uh, bitter pit, that's lack of calcium. So you gotta keep your calcium up there. I believe uh, our avocado grower tells us at least five pounds of calcium per tree per year. Lots of calcium, along with the other fertilizers. Now the mycorrhizal fungus, this if you want to apply it, uh, we do sell it in little packages. This has the mycorrhizal fungus, it also has the bacteria that breaks down organic matter too. Um, a lot of brands of fertilizer out there, including Dr. Earth, every thing of fertilizer they have has it in there. Now in the nursery, just so you know what we do here, when we start to plant off in our potting soil, because it's sterile, we start them off with osmocote, which is 15, 9, 12. Just because we know if we use an organic fertilizer, because there's no soil organisms existing in our potting soil at that time, this is going to might take a month to start working. Whereas the water soluble fertilizers like this work immediately. So we get some growth the first few days. I mean, if this works immediately. The next day, go out there and plant like screener. Whereas something like this, if it's new sterile soil, it may take a month for the bacteria to get going on this stuff where the plant can start getting this stuff. If it's in the ground, no problem. You got your, your, your already, your ecosystems there, it'll eat this up pretty quick. But in a container, uh, we learned that this is by far the best way to get them started and then follow up or even at the same time. When we grow our avocado tree, we'll do this and this at the same time. In fact, we'll use uh, probably this brand because it's got the mycorrhizas in it. We just add it right to the soil itself when we plant it. We'll do both. Get the immediate action and then that up. So, you know, chemical fertilizers, it's like you eating sugar. It's, it's, it, can, it can keep you going for a little bit, but now this one is the most widely used one in the U.S. because um, there's, you know, out of the 17 minerals, there's 14 you have to apply, actually 13 because nickel's found in everything. So 13 you apply, this has got um, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's got 10. So it's missing a couple things, but not much. There's a few chemical fertilizers that have 11 minerals in them, and that's about as high as they go but any organic fertilizer, all 17 are in there. So if you go, you know, I was told by the guys at Soil and Plant Lab in Anaheim, our customers, if you go organic, you won't come across anything in, anything over that. So if I go and buy somebody's, let's say um, pansies, okay? Mm -hmm. What I've been doing is I've been using your top soil, top, top pots to grow. Mixing it with the regular okay. Soil That's fine. And putting it in, would I need to use the osmocote? You should I fertilize them. Right. You should fertilize them. Not all growers put a time release fertilizer in their soil. Most, most, uh, especially bedding plants. Yeah. Most of the growers who have grow bedding plants, they have fertilizer in their water system and they just right. spray it. So once you put it in the ground, you need something. So, it, so would I put that on top or in it, the osmocote? Or wouldn't I use it? 
Yeah, you can use this right away. But do I put it on the top or mix it in the soil? You're supposed to mix it in the soil. We always put it on top because if we mix it in the soil, we'll come back a minute later and go, did I put that in the soil? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I understand. So if you water it, it'll mix itself in okay. well enough. But yeah, we, we just never remember anymore. So <laughs> I think you're normal. <laughs> but, we but we're told by the soil and plant lab guys, if you want to fertilize something, just throw it near the base of the plant, okay. near the trunk. Okay. He said, uh, you never know where the roots are. Just throw it near the trunk, the plant will get it. Now with organic fertilizers, farms rarely use things like this. Most of the farms, like the organic farm we're next to, where they fertilize, boy, it really stank. You can tell from miles away they were fertilizing. What they're doing is they're, they have to have a faster source. Like these work fast. These might take a long time to work. The farmers need to work now. So they need to break the stuff down. So usually they go, they, Call this farm, this company that puts them in big vats and lets them ferment <coughs> to break the organics down into chemicals, so that when they apply it, you know, it smells like sewer gas because that's what's happening with big tanks. It just stinks the place up. Now, uh, a lot of the organic people know that this is true. So, like this doctor, well, if you open this bag, it smells like a dead rat because they've broken this stuff down so it works faster works a lot faster than stuff that's not broken down. So this has very little smell, but it takes longer to work. This smells really bad, but it works quicker. So, so that's the downfall. And plus the other downfall of organics, of course, if you have a dog, watch out, the dog will eat all this stuff. So, um, may not eat the neem seed meal, that's pretty foul smelling. Okay. Um, the one other thing you can do for your soil that will help it out, <clears throat> make it more nutritionish, nutritious, is to put humic acids in it. So there's a company called John and Bob's that's been selling this for decades. Um, this is a coal deposit from Texas that they've dug out of the ground. And coal is like charcoal. So <coughs> It's organic, it doesn't, it's non-reactive, it's inorganic matter. So it's carbon that's been heated at extreme high temperatures. So it's essentially wood or bark that's heated up extreme high temperatures without any oxygen. So it doesn't turn to ash, it turns to charcoal. Nothing can eat charcoal, but charcoal, everything sticks to charcoal. So they use charcoal in filters because all the minerals stick to it. Everything sticks to charcoal. Even living organisms stick to charcoal, they like it. So the soils in the world that are rich in black, this is what makes them rich in black. So the charcoal content of the or black soils of the world, this is reported in National Geographic and uh, several uh, science magazines wrote about it too. Uh, about one and a half to two percent charcoal makes the soil black. It doesn't take. They said it doesn't take much. It makes it look black. And from that point on, that soil is going to be very rich in its new in, in, in the amount of elements or nutrition that it holds there. Um, when we threw some of the humic acids on top of a uh, root ball of a plant, just on the surface, within a couple of weeks, there was algae growing all over that stuff. <clears throat> the soil is just turning green right on the surface. So it's holding the fertilizers right there. So we know it's really good at holding nutrition. Um, they said you can go to the Amazon or to Central America and you find a green spot in the jungle and you can dig it up and you find an ancient campfire from 10,000 years ago because that charcoal is still keeping that soil real rich. So in, <clears throat> in a lot of the poorer countries, instead of throwing away their crops, what they do with them is they'll light them on fire and right when they're burning at their hottest, they'll just bulldoze and cover them up. So they're, they're real hot, they're underground, no more oxygen, they turn to charcoal. They can make their soil richer that way. <clears throat> so one of the 
main things they want to do in agriculture is figure out how to turn your waste material that you usually throw in the dump into something that makes the ground more rich. One of the, one of the things you can do is make turn into charcoal. <coughs> so they're trying to figure out cheaper ways to make charcoal because it's energy intensive to heat up something real high with no oxygen around it. Any other questions? There's a lot of stuff I didn't cover. As we go over now, next week we'll probably do it on tomatoes. We'll go over a lot of the details on tomatoes that are you know, related to this. No one knows. So the. <laughs> Uh, hard to. So if you're using, okay, the question was, can you over fertilize? If you use something organic, you can't. You really can't. Um, if you use something chemical, you got to watch out. Uh, five times too much can burn because of the salts involved. But with organic things, yeah, no matter how much organic, you know, there's some exceptions. Bird poop is almost like pure chemicals. You can overdo it with that. But most manures and <coughs> plant net plants. It won't hurt to have a whole thick layer on there. Um, you know, again, nature is five inches deep. I mean, we, I listened to a seminar once by a farm up in the state of Washington. They said they have their orchards covered with 18 inches of tree trimmings from their local tree guy and their row crops covered with 12 inches. And they said they rarely have to water, well, they rarely have to fertilize, they don't have to weed. Uh, and they really, they don't have to water it all either. They said this deep, real deep mulch layer condenses water out of the air at night. Um, if, if we were right on the coastline, that might work. I know if they said it worked in Texas, where it's like 89% humidity. Uh, anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, it seems to work too. I don't know if we're humid enough right here for that to work, but that'll it'll certainly help save water and might generate some too. Because this farm up north said they stopped watering in the 80s when they figured it out what was happening in the forest. They said they walk in the forest in the morning it was just soggy with all that dead stuff on the surface. So they did that in the orchard and they stopped watering. They have chickens so they don't fertilize either. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have a question to ask. <laughs> so I have three avocado trees, and I put probably three, four inches of mulch underneath the tree. When I fertilize them, should I remove the few inches of mulch? Or just no, I think I'm fine. Yeah, the mulch has all the organisms that will break down the fertilizer. So. Okay. Should that mulch layer come up to the top of the tree? Or does it only have to Only have to hold back if your tree's in compost. So the compost on top of compost might be too much for the root system to handle. But if you've got a healthy soil below the tree, you know, nature, there's nobody carrying it. five foot of dead leaves to get to the dirt. So it can be really deep. But your roots aren't growing in the dirt. Right. Well, you'll see root-like things in the leaves, but that's the fungus. It's like the leaf. So we have... Um, Here, I no, 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 I was going to get... I had a question. Uh, we have... Uh, this is Zara.